Today I'm excited to share with you a very, very important topic. It has to do with conflict. When was the last time you had conflict? Secondly, how many of you have conflict this week? You had conflict with somebody this week. Raise your hands. Higher. See? Exactly like the first service. The truth is conflict is inevitable. Let me repeat. Conflict is inevitable. It will surely happen. Can I tell you why? Conflict can happen because we are all different. We have our past. We have experiences. It will happen in your marriage. It will happen in your family, especially in your office, especially in the church. Believe it or not, no perfect church. So there will be conflict. For me and my wife, I was asking my wife, we don't always have conflict, but we do have conflict. Let me give an example. My wife and I are so different. When it comes to cell phone, I have a habit. I know where's my cell phone. When I go home, I know where I charge it. My wife is different. Her spirit is like free flowing. So I tell her, honey, you got to have a place for your cell phone. But she does not follow my advice. So what happens is almost every other day, we will look for her cell phone. And I told my wife, if you want to spend the rest of your life looking for a cell phone, I still love you. So we're different. My table is not really very neat, but I know exactly where are my stuff. Because that's me. My wife is very neat. She likes to compile things. So I tell her, please don't touch my table. You have your table, I have my table. But you know, my wife such a sweet lady. Sometimes she will mess around my table and I say, you touched my table, didn't you? Why? We are different. Do you realize if you don't understand conflict, you will go through life discouraged. So everybody say that with me. Conflict is inevitable. But conflict is good. You know why? I began to understand my wife more. In CCF pastoral group, we don't always agree with each other. So we have conflict. But the reason why it is always beneficial is because we resolve our differences. When we have conflict, I begin to realize your idea is different from mine. So nothing personal. We will discuss what's the best idea. And usually the best idea will win because our agenda is very simple. Our agenda is God's agenda. What is best for God's kingdom? So conflict is inevitable, but it is beneficial provided you resolve it properly. Today, I want us to look at conflict. Believe it or not, it happened in the Bible. Everybody, let's look at Acts 15. Last week, we discussed how Christianity exploded. Praise God, the Gentiles came to know Jesus. Lots of them. Acts 15 today, probably one of the most important chapters in the history of Christianity. You know why? I'll tell you why. First, let's look at the conflict. Everybody read together. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Can you understand how serious this problem was? It is not enough to believe in Jesus. You've got to be circumcised. And that's why I call this the pivotal chapter of the New Testament. If they did not handle this properly, Christianity will be corrupted. Christianity will no longer be just Jesus. It will be Jesus plus something else. Here, plus circumcision, plus joining a religion. It is very serious. The Bible tells us it was so serious, let's read, when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate, it was so serious. Conflict is inevitable. People have their ideas. With the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders 
concerning this issue. A few observations. When conflict arise, don't be shocked. But there must be a process. In the early church, there was a process. The process was they'll bring it up to Jerusalem, to the elders, to the apostles, to the mother church. Why? Because sometimes conflict cannot be resolved by yourselves. You need others. In this case, they brought it to the mother church. Ladies and gentlemen, do not get shocked when there is conflict. You will surely have conflict. But do you know the process? Today, I want to share with you from Acts 15. How do you resolve conflict? You can apply the principles in your family, in your office, in the church. Would you like to learn how to resolve conflict? This is so important. The study was made in the University of Copenhagen. This is their research when it comes to conflict. People with many conflicts, 100%, will surely die earlier than those who know how to resolve conflict. Let me repeat. If you want to live longer, you better learn how to resolve conflict. If you want to die sooner, it's okay. Keep on having conflict. So you want to live longer or die faster? You like to live longer or live shorter? Longer. All right. I'll teach you how to resolve conflict. It can happen to anybody. I requested Pastor Glenn, a man of God, and his family, believe it or not, Pastor Glenn is a pastor, a godly man, and yet he had conflict. Would you like to hear how he resolved conflict? Let's give him a warm welcome. Pastor Glenn. My name is Dr. Glenn Obligation, and I've been with CCF for almost 33 years now. I am presently overseeing both the worship ministry of CCF, which we call EXALT, and our CCF North EDSA satellite, who's joining us right now on live stream. Hello, CCF North EDSA. Last March 27, our entire family was blessed by God to travel to the U.S. together to attend the wedding of our eldest daughter in Hawaii. I was excited because for the first time after decades, we finally had the opportunity to bond with our relatives in the U.S. and visit places my children have been dreaming of since they were younger. I was looking forward to having one of the most enjoyable vacations for us. But during the trip, we clashed with one another. There were misunderstandings, miscommunications, and there was also a time when I felt disrespected. Instead of flaring up, I kept quiet and had this growing pain in my heart. At one point during the trip, I gathered the family and expressed my hurt. Although apologies were given, we knew and felt that there were still unresolved issues in our hearts, which caused us to have indifference in the family. When we got back to the Philippines three weeks later, the indifference in our relationships persisted. I, I lost the joy in my heart um, and was not excited to go home every day. In one of my morning talks with God, I told him, Lord, I already did my part in teaching my children to obey and respect. But if they don't want to respect me, then so be it. Then the Lord rebuked me. Glenn, parenting is a lifelong work. Don't give up. To which I replied, yes, Lord. However, in spite of that rebuke, I still didn't do anything to resolve the issues, and I let that bitterness stay in my heart. My name is Nicole, and I am his daughter, the fourth out of five children. Although there were many amazing highlights during our trip to the U.S., my siblings and I had conflicts with each other and our parents almost every day. We were smiling on the outside, but we were very much broken inside. With pride in our hearts, we threw unloving words at each other. We were quick to judge, blame, and become defensive too. I constantly expressed my heartbreak to God as I saw how it was normal for our family to worship and serve in ministry when we were not honoring Him at home. Two weeks ago, I let my pride take control of my heart and I ended up causing tension between me and my sister. At first, I did not want to apologize, 
but by God's grace, He gave me the strength to do so, and our relationship was restored. Because of this, God impressed on my heart to initiate a family meeting the next day and apply humility in it too. After more than a month of being indifferent towards each other, my parents, siblings, and I finally set aside time to talk. During our meeting, I asked everyone, including myself, two questions that night. First, what changes do you want to see in our family? And second, what changes do you want to see in yourself in relation to the family? By God's grace, He inspired me to set the tone of humility by asking everyone to answer the second question first, instead of starting the conversation with a list of hurts and explosions of pride that we nurtured for the longest time. We began by admitting our own shortcomings and shared our desire to improve. By the time we moved on to question number one, where our issues would be raised, each member surprisingly extended and received grace. Not only did we know each other and our hurts more, we also had the opportunity to forgive, to ask for forgiveness, and to believe the best towards each other. Hugs were given, tears were shed, Tips to love each other were suggested, and walls among us were slowly being destroyed. We ended the night by encouraging each other to grow in our relationship with Jesus and in our love for the family by the power of the Holy Spirit. God taught me many lessons through this experience. Number one, we need to pray for protection from Satan, who is relentless in attacking families and destroying relationships. Number two, if we don't resolve conflicts early, many others will be affected and the walls between the family members will build up. We need to humble ourselves, reconcile with each other, and trust God that uh, He will be the one to heal the broken relationships. Number three, children can also be used by God to help resolve conflicts in the family. Even though I'm the father and I'm overseeing ministries, I let unforgiveness stay in my heart when my daughter obeyed God by facilitating that meeting one month after we arrived, we all slowly experienced healing. Today, by God's grace, we are able to extend love and grace to each other. We're back in exchanging jokes, hugging each other, updating one another several times a day through our group chat. I personally am so excited to come home every day and be with my family again. Our families have hope in Jesus. To God be the glory. So the topic is very simple today. Everybody, let's read the topic today. Resolve conflict in truth and love. You've got to resolve conflict. Now, how do you resolve conflict? May I suggest, in Acts 15, you will notice the following outline. Number one, proactive. Say that with me. Proactive. Proactive, one more time. Do not be passive. Filipinos. Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, the, Philipp the Asian race, we don't want confrontation. We want to avoid it. If possible, the way we solve conflict is by denial, by withdrawing. Glenn partially withdrew. Friends, do not withdraw. Be proactive. Take action. Number two, may I suggest, when you deal with conflict, it should be personal, face to face. Make sure you're willing to meet. Many times, people don't want to meet. They want to course it through other people. So face to face. Number three, another perspective is this. When you resolve conflict, everybody, look at me now. You should listen. What is the problem? What's the perspective? What is the other party's complaint? Then you listen to God. What is God's perspective? And then you listen to the leaders. What is their perspective? In other words, there is a process. The process is you take action face to face. Number two, you hear, listen, what's their perspective? And number three, my message is you need to practice love. In resolving conflict, you need to practice love. It's not always easy. And number four, you need to pursue God's agenda. So how do we see this in the book of Acts? Are you ready? All right, let's find out. But before we find out, let me show you the spiritual uh, guidelines on why you need to resolve conflict. Let's read this together. I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord 
with which you are being called. Paul is now telling the believers, you act like a believer. You walk like a believer. Because we have been redeemed. We are now believers. Walk worthy of what God has done for us. So what must you do? Everybody read. Number one, with all humility. To resolve conflict, you need humility. Gentleness. Patience. To understand perspective, you need to be patient and listen. Showing tolerance for one another in love. Tolerance and love. My friend, they will not always be like you. I mean, we are different. We need to learn to accept each other. Everybody read. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. You see? We are already together because of the Holy Spirit, but we need to preserve it. The devil would like to divide. I've been to many churches. I've advised many leaders. And I always know this one thing. The devil would like to split families, split churches, divide groups. That's the devil's work. That's his name, Diabolos. Diabolos means what? The divider. We are one. Look at the next verse. We are one body. Notice variety. The Christian life is compared to a body. We have different parts, different functions, but we are one. Same thing with the church. One spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. One hope. Our hope is really the coming of Jesus to transform this universe, this world. One Lord. That's our master, not ourselves, not our denominations. One Lord, one faith. There's only one faith, who Jesus is, what he did for us. One faith. One baptism. I don't know how many of you are baptized already, but when you were baptized, did the pastor say, I'm baptizing you in my name? Or did the pastor say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? You see, we belong to God. We belong to Jesus. One baptism. You're not joining a church when you're baptized. It's to Jesus. One God and Father. Notice, you count the number of ones in this verse. How many ones? One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Seven. My friend, the Bible is saying you need to preserve our unity. So turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, let's preserve our unity. You see, the Bible tells us, Paul, applying the teachings of Jesus, I urge Judea and I urge Sintiki, two women, to live in harmony. You see, there were problems in the early church. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women. No, I'm not saying women are more problematic, okay? I'm not saying that. But if you like to believe it, it's up to you. But the reality is these two women are having problems. Paul did not tell us their problems. He only, he simply said, everybody read. I ask you, plural, grammatically, I ask all of you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are written, whose names are in the book of life. In other words, you can have conflict, still go to heaven. These women have conflict, but you have to resolve it. Friends, women are women. Men are men. And when you hear there is conflict, you cannot say, it is not my problem. It is our problem. So I tell our pastors, I tell all our D-group leaders, if there is conflict within your group, it is incumbent upon us to help people reconcile. Because that is our calling. We are one body. In fact, that is the heart of Jesus. When before Jesus died, this was his last public prayer to the disciples. Look at what he prayed. To the, when he was with the disciples. Everybody read. Jesus is saying, I do not ask on behalf of this alone, not just for these disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So Jesus is thinking of us. 
I am praying even for those future believers who will believe through their word. That's us. Everybody read. That they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world, not so that the world may believe that you sent me. Unity is so crucial. Harmony is so crucial. Because the best way to witness to the world is how we love each other. And that's why the devil would like to split churches. Because when you split churches, when there's division, it causes what? The world to say, Christian, are these Christians? Why are they always fighting among themselves? Is this the Christian family? Why are they separating? What's wrong with this group? My friend, unity is the heart of Jesus. Put yourself in the shoes of God. I'm a father. I like my five wonderful children to love each other. I don't want them to be fighting. The same thing with God. God loves us. God wants believers to love one another. Amen? So, what's the topic today? Resolve conflict in truth and love. So how do we do this? Let's read this together. Being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing in detail the, con the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And the Bible tells us when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. All right, so you now know the background. Paul and Barnabas went back to the mother church and described to them what happened? As he was describing to them, this is the problem. Some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Ladies and gentlemen, do you understand the problem? Do not judge these people because they are very sincere. Throughout their lives, they grew up as Jewish. They were trained in the law of Moses. They were all circumcised. Now, if you don't know circumcision, you and I know circumcision was given by God to Abraham to tell his children, to, to show that you are my people, you must circumcise every male born on the eighth day. So Jewish men are circumcised on the eighth day. So the Jewish people are very sincere. You know, now that we know Jesus, all of these Gentiles must also be part of the Jewish religion so they can be saved. Do you understand their mindset? For many, many years, only Jewish people are considered people of God. And now suddenly Jesus comes around and he has transformed the lives of the Jewish people. And yet, what is surprising is you have Gentiles who are Gentiles, by the way? Who are Gentiles? Can you turn to your neighbor? Tell your neighbor, you are Gentiles. We are Gentiles. What happened to the early church? There was an amazing outpouring of God's Spirit to the Gentiles. They were beginning to become Christians. So, as they are going to the church, the Pharisees, who are now followers of Jesus, they have become Christian, are thinking, you need to be circumcised. This is a serious problem. If this is not addressed, imagine. If this is not addressed, you will not have the book of Galatians. You will not have this emphatic truth that salvation is by grace alone through faith. You will have two kinds of Christianity. One, by grace. The other one, grace plus good works. Worst of all, you have church division. Serious problem. So how do they resolve this? Remember, it was so serious, let's read. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. Friends, you have to be proactive. When there is a problem, be proactive. Don't be passive. Don't allow chance to resolve problems. Problems are, certain, are, are seldom resolved by accidents. You need to be proactive. Next, you need to understand perspective, where are they coming from? And to solve problems, you, you must meet eye to eye, face to face. 
Somebody said this years ago, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. When you want to resolve conflict, you ask yourself, is this really essential? Is this something very, very important? If it is non-essential, it's okay. For example, my wife and I, we're different. I allow her. She likes certain food. I like certain food. I don't have to force her. Do you know years ago, my wife asked me, Peter, do you want to marry a Peter? I said, what, what do you mean? He said, you want me to be exactly like you. Do you want to marry a Peter? And I was thinking, Tama si Mises, ano? I want my wife just to be like me. That's not right. I praise God. My wife is different. She is spontaneous. She is creative. Imagine if everybody's like you. You know why you get irritated with people? Because they don't think like you. They don't act like you. So turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, I accept you as is where is. All right? So we got to resolve conflict. There will surely be conflict 100%. The way you see things. These are Jews. But if it is very important, you need to step in. So, what are essentials? My professor taught me this years ago. Essentials are things you will die for. These are essentials. You die for it. You are willing to die for it. You can debate. Certain things you don't have to die for. You can discuss. Are we clear? So, what are essentials that you must die for and what are non-essentials? Listen to me. Parents, I'm going to tell you now with your children. Your children will do certain things that will irritate you. Now, you got to ask yourself, is this something worth discussing? Or will I, will I just allow it to slide? Because you cannot be petty on everything. So here are my suggestions. When it comes to church issues, when it comes to doctrine, what are doctrines you must die for? Example for me. Who is Jesus? The Son of God. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through Jesus. That's basic. Non-negotiable. What's essential? The Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. That's foundational. Non-negotiable. The Gospel. What is the Gospel? What is the good news? Jesus died for our sins and He rose again from the dead. And if you believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven. That's the Gospel. Salvation, everybody read. Salvation by grace alone, through faith. This is foundational. Salvation is not by good works. It's by grace, through faith. Foundational, non-negotiable. Authority of scriptures. You see, in some churches, they teach. Authority of scripture is equal with authority of men, authority of tradition. For us, scripture has the final authority. And everything else must be in submission to the Bible. Are we clear? Now, the problem is this. What if there are different interpretations? And that's why we teach you how to study the Bible. The Bible is very clear on basic issues. On basic issues, no debate. On some issues, I'll share with you what are some debatable issues. Indwelling and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is essential. Without the Holy Spirit, the Christian life is impossible. So we teach the Holy Spirit. You have to be filled. You get to be empowered. Second coming of Jesus, it is so important. Jesus is coming soon, all right? So these are examples of essentials. They are in CCF statement of faith. Now, what are secondary? When is the second coming of Jesus? You know, some sincere believers believe in pre-tribulation. They are called pre-trib. Before the great tribulation, Jesus will come again. For some people, they believe in mid-trib. In the middle of the tribulation, Jesus will come. For some sincere believers, they believe in post-trib. After the seven years of tribulation, Jesus will come. For me, it does not matter. You don't have to die. For when is Jesus coming? What is sure is Jesus is coming again? Are we clear? If you don't believe in when he's coming, as long as you believe he's coming, it's okay with me. 
divorce and remarriage. This is a very, very debatable issue. Because for thousands of years, Christians from both sides have been arguing. God hates divorce, no problem. What if they've been divorced before coming to Christ? What if they've been divorced before knowing Jesus? Their family is messed up. The wife is remarried. The husband is remarried. And now they meet somebody. Can you remarry them? Do you see how controversial this is? For some people, they will die for this truth. No, no, no. You can never remarry. For some people, no. Look at me. This is not worth dying for. In CCF, we have our position. You want to know our position? <laughs> Another topic. But you ask the elders, you ask the pastors. God hates divorce. Can people remarry? Case to case. It depends. Understand what I'm saying? But people will die for this. I will not die for this. It's not worth dying for. We can discuss. We can debate. What about style of baptism? Some people believe in sprinkling. Some people believe in immersion. Now look at me. Will you die for this? Here's somebody in the hospital. High fever. He's about to die. And he comes to know Jesus. He said, Pastor, I want to be baptized. Oh, will you not allow sprinkling? Or will you say, I got to bring you to the Pasig River? <laughs> Mama na nga. You still insist on immersion. All I'm saying is, these are not essential. Do you agree with me? But some people, everything is essential. It takes maturity to know the difference. Church governance. How do you govern the church? Is it congregational? By election of the members? Is it Episcopalian? Is it Presbyterian by the elders? How, what is this? My friend, this is not worth dying for. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, for some churches, baptism of the Holy Spirit is different from salvation. They believe after coming to Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, but you need another baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's called terminology. The problem is terminology. For some people, you need to speak in tongues the, the, as proof that you have the Holy Spirit. Is this worth dying for, my friend? To me, what is important is this. When you receive Jesus Christ by faith, you receive the Holy Spirit. But some people will argue. Tithing, my goodness. Some people will argue. How many percent? 10, 8, 11, 12? No more tithing, just giving. My friend, is this worth dying for? You want to know CCF stand? Most biblical, that's it. So we'll teach you another day. Do we believe in tithing? Of course. Now, tertiary. Worship format. Music style. Do we allow drums? Do we allow guitar? You know, during my days, years ago, I remember organ music, piano, no guitar, no drums. People will die for this. Do you know that? They will divide for this. Crazy. What about preaching style? Expository only. Cannot be topical. Book by book. You know what I tell these people? You want book by book, verse by verse, you got a problem. Because Jesus never did it that way. The Apostle Paul never preached that way. And you don't have the New Testament for the first 300 years. So how are you going to do verse by verse? Friends, this is not worth dying for. What about this one? Days and time of worship? Should it be a Friday? Should it be a Saturday? Should it be a Sunday? What about frequency of the Lord's Supper? For some people, it should be every week. For some people, every day. For some people, it's up to you. In CCF, how often do we do this? Once a month. You like it more often? Do it in your small group. But my point is, this is not worth dying for. What about clothes to wear? Movies to watch? Do you know, during my time, ladies are not allowed to wear pants? Yeah, you can only wear skirts. Men are not allowed to wear short pants to worship. You know why? You are blaspheming the name of God. 
you're not allowed to go to movies. Spirituality is no smoking, no drinking, no movies, wearing clothes properly. My friend, look at me. Are you listening to me? These are not worth dying for. So ladies, look at me. If you are wearing mini skirt, I just ask you to think. Will I glorify God's name? We don't legislate. Do you notice? If you want to wear tight jeans, very, very tight, it's up to you. But my point is, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Are we clear? Okay. Can I drink? Can I smoke? Can... Listen to me. You and the Lord, will this bring glory to God? When I'm with other Christians who are very conservative, ultra-conservative, I'm very ultra-careful. I will not touch wine, even though drinking is a sin. My friends, be careful. What is essential, what is not essential. Immature Christians, young Christians, immature. Everything is worth dying for. They, everything is a major issue. Ladies, do you have to be married to a husband who is very petty? Everything is big stuff. Look, look at me. Remember that book, Don't Sweat Over the Small Stuff? So my friend, I'm just telling you, understand. Unity is important. Resolve conflict. But you cannot resolve every little conflict in life because it is impossible. There are so many differences. For example, where's Dr. Glenn? You know, I love Dr. Glenn, okay? Dr. Glenn, he likes to eat pork. He likes to eat pork. Me, I like to eat what? Fish. We love each other. Do you know I like the Leviticus diet? I like the healthy food. Avoid shrimp, avoid crab. But will I make that into a policy? If you eat shrimp, if you eat crab, let's divide. Put up another church. We don't do that. It's not worth dying for. Are we clear? All right. My friend, how do you resolve conflict? So, face to face, okay? You need to take initiative, proactive. Let's read this. There had been much debate. Peter stood up and said, everybody read. Brethren, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter is now the spokesman. There is a process. Peter apparently was a leader, so he spoke. He said, the people heard the gospel and they believed. Notice, Peter continued, God who knows the heart testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. Peter is now appealing to divine perspective. God himself accepted these people. He made no distinction between us and them. Everybody read together. Cleansing their hearts by faith. What Peter is saying is salvation does not require circumcision. It's by faith. Do you understand what Peter is saying? Remember, to resolve conflict, you need to have face-to-face -face dialogue. You need to discuss. And then, Peter continued. Let's read. Why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? What is that yoke? The yoke of legalism. I must do this. I must not do that in order to go to heaven. But everybody read now. Everybody, but we believe. We are saved. Notice, you are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. This is the most pivotal chapter, if you ask me. Because in the book of Acts, Christianity was growing. And now you have this problem. is salvation by grace alone. Ladies and gentlemen, how can one go to heaven? Is that a very important question? As early as the first 20, as soon as Jesus died, a few years later, you have this problem already. People were teaching another doctrine. They were saying grace plus something else. And Peter is saying, no. There's a process. They went to the mother church and they discussed this. My friend, let me ask you a question. 
How can one go to heaven? Option one, faith in Jesus, plus good works, religion, rituals. That is what they were about to do. Include religion, then you are saved. In this country, believe it or not, there are many sincere people. They believe the way to go to heaven is faith in Jesus plus something else. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why the book of Galatians was written. To overcome this wrong belief. This is almost true, but this is heretical. Because what is the biblical principle? Everybody, faith in Jesus. That's it. Put your faith in Jesus. It's equal to salvation. What is the evidence of faith? Resulting in good works. You will never be sure of your salvation if you don't understand the grace of God. The grace of God simply means you cannot earn salvation, you will never be good enough. It's all by God, what he did for you. All you need to do is admit you're a sinner, be willing to repent, and come to Jesus. Notice what the Bible says. Together, our authority. Together, please read. For by grace. Notice, for by grace. You don't deserve this. You have been saved. You can have assurance of salvation. Many people are not sure of salvation. You know why? They don't understand grace. For by grace, today you can be sure. You have been saved. How? Through faith. What is faith? Trusting in what God has done for you. He died on the cross for your sins. He paid the penalty. And that not of yourself, not because of you are qualified, no. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. So the gospel is very clear, not because of good works. However, people miss the next verse. What is the next verse? Everybody read. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Notice good works comes after salvation. It is not a prerequisite for salvation. It comes after you are saved. Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. So ladies and gentlemen, you must clearly understand, genuine faith will result in genuine transformation and good works will follow. What is the other side? The other side is abusing the grace of God. Let's read this together. <clears throat> licentiousness, what is licentiousness? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, a license to sin. Because I have Jesus already, I'm going to heaven, it's okay to sin. And deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, do you see the errors, one is legalism. I got to do this, I got to do that in order to go to heaven. The other error, I'm saved already. I can do anything I want to do. I remember this girl telling my wife, I'm going to divorce my husband. My wife said, why will you divorce your husband? What is the biblical ground? No biblical ground. I'm just not happy with him anymore. I met another guy. God wants me to be happy. Anyway, I'm saved. I'm saved already. God wants me to be happy. My friend, that kind of discussion, I'm saved already, is dangerous. There's no fruit. There's no evidence. So what this girl has is religion. Does not have Christ. You know why? If you have Christ, you will not deny him. Look, who turned the grace of our God into license and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. You know, who is a Christian? A Christian is somebody who understands grace. I cannot deserve heaven. Jesus died for me. He paid for all my sins on the cross. And I've given my life to him. I will now follow Jesus. So a Christian is simply somebody who understands grace, and he's now a follower of Jesus. Now, if you don't follow Jesus, is Jesus your master? Everybody, look at me now. If you say you're a Christian, but you don't follow Jesus at this moment. You don't follow Jesus. Is he your master? 
Louder. Now, the last thing I want to do is to play games with all of you. And I'm very concerned with many Christians who are playing games with the Lord. You are never serious about your Christian life. You know why you don't understand grace? Real grace will transform your heart. Real grace will make you love Jesus. So perhaps you don't have grace. Because I cannot love Jesus on my own. When I learn about the love of God and the grace of God, it makes me cry. How can God accept me? I understood the grace of God. I began to hate sin. I began to run away from sin. Why? The grace of God. I'm not saying you must do A, B, C in order to go to heaven. No, no. I cannot go to heaven with my good works. And I will never be good enough to go to heaven. It's all by grace. Amen? But what is real grace? Look at your heart. Do you have a sincere desire to follow Jesus? If you don't have a sincere desire to follow Jesus and please God, I'm concerned that some of you don't really have Jesus. No transformation. No relationship. No love. No evidence. At the same time, don't judge people. I will never judge people. You don't belong to Jesus. Only God knows. Amen? I'm to love people. I cannot judge. So the Bible tells us they kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul. Notice, to resolve conflict, you got to listen. You got to hear the perspective of the other side. You got to keep quiet. May I ask all the men to stand up? Men, stand up. Men, I want to teach you how to resolve conflict. Men, stand up. You know what's our greatest problem? We don't listen. When we have problems, we want to insist on our own ideas. May I advise? Listen. Keep silent. When there's a conflict, you ask your wife, you ask your loved ones, what is the issue? What's the problem? Listen. Everybody, all the men, say, listen. Listen. That's how you resolve conflict. There's a process. You be proactive. You see them face to face. And you Listen. So who do you listen to? It's okay. Listen to your wife also, okay? So gentlemen, sit down. Wives, stand up. Ladies, stand up. Ladies, I know you girls have the gift of talking. (laughs) But I wonder if you have the gift of listening. Ladies, you want to resolve conflict? If you have conflict with somebody, with your husband, what must you do? Louder. Listen, listen, listen. Parents, do you listen to your children? Or do you lecture your children immediately? You know, when children have problems, many parents, instead of listening, lecture immediately. No, no, no. Look. Everybody read. Kept silent. They were listening. You need to learn to listen. Amen? So who will you listen to? Who? Listen to others. Listen to your children. Your children will get shocked today if you say, Anak, I really like to listen to you. Wow, really? You want to listen to me? You mean I'm a human being? You want to listen to me? Yes. What's your idea about computer games? Can I hear? Yeah. Your children will love you so much. But I'm not saying let them play. I'm not saying that. I'm saying listen, listen. Sit down. And they had stopped speaking. Notice you let them finish. When they finish speaking, then you speak again. This time James answered. Now who is James? Look, in this chapter, you have Peter who spoke. Then Paul and Barnabas. And now you have... James. Who is James? Not the apostle. He was beheaded, remember? In Acts chapter what? 5, 6? He was beheaded. No more James, the apostle. This is James, the brother of Jesus. How do I know? The Bible is very clear. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? 
and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, Judas. Jesus had brothers. And the Bible tells us when Jesus died, he appeared to James. Why? Because James did not believe in Jesus. James cannot believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He can never comprehend how his brother can suddenly be the Messiah, the King of Kings, until Jesus died and rose again. And when Jesus appeared to him, this shows you something about Jesus. Jesus loved his earthly family. He appeared to James. And history tells us James is called the just. He wrote the book of James. He became mart a martyr. He died for, con for the confession that Jesus died and rose again. So this James became the leader. He became like the bishop of the church in Jerusalem. This is James. Notice what he said. He said, Simeon, Peter, related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. So he was now appealing to everybody, talking about what Peter experienced. And then he used the Bible. James is now quoting the Old Testament. With this, the words of the prophets agree. You see, James is not saying, I am the brother of Jesus. You all listen to me. Ah, perspective. Divine perspective. Listen to me. Every time you have an issue, you have a problem, you must be proactive. And you must see the perspective of the other person. You must see the perspective of God. And you must see the perspective of the leaders. Because there is a process. You need to learn to listen. What is the perspective of God? And here's the perspective of God. After these things, I will return. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it. Now, you are non-Jews, so it's hard for you to understand this. Let me explain to you. In the Old Testament, the promised Messiah will come from the family line of David. But for many years, hundreds of years, Jerusalem was conquered. Israel was no more. Remember? Babylonian Empire, the Roman Empire. So the house of David is destroyed. But the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, I will rebuild the house of David. The Messiah will come from this line. I'm going to raise up the house of David. And then the Bible says, so that, so that what? So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. The descendant of David that was raised up was none other than Jesus. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. So, Apostle uh, James, the brother of Jesus, quoted the Old Testament that this Jesus, who is from the house of David, will now bring the whole world to Jesus. In the past, it's only Jews that can come to God in the past. But he is saying no more. Through Jesus, all of us are included in God's people. Amen? Is that good news or bad news? So you don't have to be circumcised anymore. And the Bible tells us, look at what James said. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. In Tagalog, practice love. Huwag natin pahirapan. It's not a big issue. James did not say, let's have a vote. Let's have a vote. No, no. He said, it is my judgment. Submission to the leadership. Friends, there are processes. Daughter church goes to the mother church. Elders, they are experienced, they know. And the Bible tells us that is exactly what happened. Notice what James said. James said, we will also write them. We write to them. Now, what is the concession? What did James say? Practice love. Abstain from things contaminated by idols, from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from the blood. James mentioned a few Jewish practices. 
Don't eat food sacrificed to idols, strangled with blood, for fornication. Why? Let me tell you why. Because James is saying, for Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. In other words, the churches that Paul started, most of them began from the synagogues, lots of Jewish people. And he said, these Jewish people will surely stumble if you don't act in love. Be careful with food. It is not essential to salvation, but walk in love. What do I mean? Let's look at the Bible. Please together. Food will not com commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. You see, weak Christians have a lot of what do you call this? Mabusisi. What is that in English? Busisi. They are so petty. They, they, they are bothered by so many things. These are weak Christians, okay? Bawalito, bawalito, bawalito. That's what the Bible is saying. You respect them. Don't make fun of them. Don't cause them to stumble. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Do you see the principle of love? I want to resolve conflict. If what I'm doing is causing you problem, it's okay. These are not essentials, but because of love, it's okay. Look at the next verse. I love this. Together. Whether then you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's my guiding principle. When I resolve conflict, I say whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks, or to the church of God. Just I also please all men in all things. You think of others, walk in love, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. It's very sad when Christians fight among ourselves, and we divide among ourselves, and we don't talk to each other. You need to follow the process, proactive, face-to-face. -face. Take initiative. Don't wait. See each other face-to-face. -face. And then what must you do? Perspective. Listen. Listen to them. And what must you do? You practice love. Give and take. It's not essential. Okay na, pabayan mo na. I remember there was a time. I don't, I don't know if Ito remember. Ito and I, secretly, we don't have to tell you what it is. We had a problem together. And we submitted to the elders. And the elders told us what to do. Remember that, Ito? And we resolve it. That's why this guy loved me so much. Because I don't agree with the elders, but I submitted. <laughs> no, that's joking. But the point is this. Friends, there is a way. There is a way to resolve problems. Yes or no? You listen. No, notice. It seemed good to the apostles and the elders. It seemed good to the apostles and elders. With the whole church to choose men from among them, to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Notice, face to face, you send people. <laughs> Judas called Barsabas, Silas, leading men. Notice, not just leading men. They're very smart, they're very wise. They chose a guy by the name of Judas. Barsabas, Judas, Jewish. And a guy by the name of Silas, a Roman citizen. More like the Gentiles, even though he's not a Gentile. Silas, more Greek, Judas, more Jewish, together to meet with the churches, to explain the letter. So let's read together. They send this letter by them. Everybody read. The apostles and the brethren who are elders to the brethren in Antioch. Syria, Cilicia. Different churches, different satellites. There is a process. There's a chain of authority. And they say, we write you, the apostles and the brethren who are elders. These are the leaders. Everybody read. 
Since we have heard that some of our number to whom we have no instruction have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. You may not realize this. In CCF Elders Board, many times, we're unanimous when issues are brought to us. Why? We want to know the mind of God. We pray. And the Bible tells us, let's read, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, these men have no agenda. Just God's agenda. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, more Jewish, Roman citizens. His name is Silvanus who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. You see, proactive, perspective, practice love. You've got to practice love face-to-face. -face. Comprende? So it's important face-to-face. -face. I do not know why many Christians don't want to resolve conflict face-to-face. -face. Don't use text. Are you listening to me? Don't ever use text. Don't ever use email. Don't ever use phone to resolve conflict. Face-to-face. Ideally. And then, let's read this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Notice, I did not put prayer here anymore. It's understood. They prayed. The Holy Spirit is involved. And to us, to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. So, what are the essentials for the church in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia? For the churches there, look, <laughs> that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. You know fornication? Are you listening to me, young people? A lot of people think it's okay to have sex outside of marriage as long as you are not married. Let me repeat. People think it's okay to have sex as long as the person is not married. That's not true. Fornication talks about any kind of sex, singles, married, any kind of sex outside marriage, fornication. That's wrong. That is a moral issue. Don't do that. And then he tells us, if you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Adios. Farewell. You see, simple letter. Explained by face-to-face -face communication. So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, having gar gathered the congregation together. They delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. My friend, your job and my job is to encourage the believers. When there's a conflict and you don't resolve it properly, it's very discouraging. I tell people, is your action going to encourage believers or discourage believers? Look, <clears throat> Judas and Silas, being prophets themselves, encourage and strengthen the brethren. The whole objective is encourage people, build them up. After they had spent time there, they were sent away from brethren in peace to those who had sent them out. Why were they sent out again? You know why they were sent out again? Because you must pursue God's agenda. God's agenda is to preach the gospel. It seemed good to Silas to remain there, but Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch. Everybody read, teaching and preaching with many others, the word of the Lord. My friend, that's our agenda. Seek God's agenda, and that's how you resolve conflict. You see, conflict is often fueled when you elevate personal agenda over God's agenda. Think about it. You know why people are in conflict? They have their own agenda. My agenda is very simple. I want to glorify God. And whatever CCF will do, we want to win people to Jesus, make them into Christ-likeness. We want to build disciples to build disciples. That is our agenda. I tell the pastor, no private agenda. It's not about CCF. It's all about God. Are we clear? If you have a common agenda, you will not have problems. So, why do I like this picture? Somebody shared this with me years ago. <clears throat> if people have a common agenda, common mission, the church is like a boat. 
If everybody's rowing in the same direction, there's no conflict. When will conflict arise? When somebody is not rowing, when somebody is just sitting there and criticizing, oh, 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 you know, my friend, if we're all rowing, if we're all rowing, why will there be conflict? Because our agenda is the same, yes or no? Now, let me ask you a question. What is God's mission for CCF? Do you, my experience is people who are not serving the Lord are the ones that's complaining the most. People who are serving the Lord have no time to complain, seriously. They will only discuss major issues. I don't have time for minor issues. You know why? I'm so busy with the major issues. I'm not sacrificing truth, but I'm saying the essentials, be very clear. If something is not very clear in the Bible, you can interpret it both ways. It's not essential. You can interpret it both ways. Well, it's okay. I respect you. So, what is God's agenda? As we close, this is God's agenda. Everybody read together. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, new things have come. God's agenda is to make all of us new. I don't know your past. I don't know what you have done in the past, but all of us need a new chance. Yes or no? The Bible says, God's agenda. If anyone is in Christ, he makes all things new. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the good news. How does he make all things new? Let's read. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The greatest reconciler, the greatest person who wanted to resolve conflict is God. And he gave his son. The Bible tells us, God reconciled us to himself through Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, two kinds of people in this room. You cannot reconcile, you cannot resolve conflict with other people until you resolve the biggest conflict. It's your conflict with God. Let me repeat. You and I cannot resolve horizontal conflicts until you resolve the vertical conflict. And the Bible says you need to be reconciled to God. Look at the next verse. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself through Christ. Do you see what God is saying? I want you to be reconciled to me. I gave you Jesus. Not counting their trespasses against them, he has committed to you and to me the word of reconciliation. My job is to help people reconcile to God first and to each other. My friends, do you know how to resolve conflict today? Get right with God. And then you can get right with people. Be proactive. Let's read this. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I stand before you today asking you, be reconciled to God. And then be reconciled to your loved ones. Let's bow our heads. There may be some people here today, you have not been reconciled to God. You don't have peace. You are not even sure of your salvation. You don't know the meaning of the word saved. But you like to be sure today. You want to be sure you are saved. I want to pray for you. Raise your hands. Those of you who want to be sure you want to be saved, raise your hands. Be reconciled to God. Higher, higher. My friends, with your hands raised up, I want you to listen to me clearly. To be saved is simply to be reconciled to God. How can you be reconciled to God? As your hands are raised up, it's all by grace. You don't have to say, I need to do this, I need to do that, no. To be saved is simply you accept Jesus Christ by faith. A, B, C, admit you're a sinner. Believe he loves you, he died for you. And then you come to Jesus in repentance. Are you listening to me? Those of you who are raising your hands. 
So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Those of you who are not yet sure, okay? Now pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I'm not sure I'm saved. Today I want to be sure. I realize it's all by grace. I realize it's not by good works. I realize it's not because of me. It's all because of you, what you have done for me by grace. I don't deserve this, Jesus. I now come to you. Lord Jesus, I receive your gift of forgiveness. I accept your gift of eternal life. Thank you for dying on the cross in my behalf. Change my heart. Change my life. Bring your hands down. I now challenge everybody. God wants you to resolve conflict. If there is anybody today that you seem to have conflict, somehow it has not been resolved, I'd like you to pray. I'd like you to be proactive. I'd like you to understand their perspective. And I'd like you to go through the process. What's the process? If you cannot solve it yourselves, you get other people to help you. There's a process. Go to the leaders. But please, don't neglect resolving conflict. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you are the great reconciler. We thank you that you are the one who, has, who have commanded us to live in harmony. And you want us to bring glory, honor to your name. I now pray for all CC efforts that we will all walk in humility that we will realize the importance of harmony, the importance of resolving conflict. And Lord, it's because of you. Help us to walk in love. Help us to practice patience, listening to one another. Will you bless CCF so that we will bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we all pray, amen and amen. God bless you.